Hello there. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. Connie Willis here, our last segment with Eric, the mind control guy. You can find him on Facebook. Just look up in the public group, Eric, the mind control guy. Also, you can go to YouTube, I guess, as well. And I know you just created the one in Facebook, so it's slowly building. I'm watching, and everybody's kind of mentioning some things to you, so you're going you're gonna to be busy there for a while. I like that. We're going to make you... Uh, get into uh, uh, working on this and, and putting putting the word out as you want it. Now we got some other calls on the line, but I'm going to ask you something, Eric, because I know time flies, and I want to get some of these answers out. Um, so you're still with me, right? Nothing yes. has changed. You're still there. Okay. All right. So you're talking a lot about the fear and how they were testing you guys with fear, and then they would do something to uh, erase your minds and go from there. What about the control part? Okay, I get the fear thing. What were they doing to my, you know, control your mind? What were the things that they made you do? And uh, I mean, what, what, what's, what was the most unique just for time reasons that you were like, there's no way somebody could have even thought to do this, but they did. Well, like the Manchurian candidate testing, uh, they started off small and simple and they worked their way up. Uh, they would have, they would put a gun in your hand and it had blanks in it. Of course, you didn't know it had blanks. And they would have somebody standing there or an image. And the very first one of those I remember doing, uh, they had me uh, there. It was uh, Dr. Dirtbag and another one, Dr. Peterson. And uh, they told me I had to do this test. And I didn't want to be there. I wanted to go back to the barracks. And uh, I had to raise the gun and shoot this person that I believe was a real person with a real gun in my hand. And anyway, I said, I want to go back to the barracks. He said, you got to do the test. I want to go back to the barracks. They said, look, you know, do the test and you can go back to the barracks. So I said, okay. I raised the gun, boom, pulled the trigger. I said, now I want to go back to the barracks. And they ignored me. And uh, one of them looked at one of the doctors looked at the other one and said he shows promise, and it irritated me that they ignored me. So I raised the gun at them. I said I said I want to go back to the barracks. Oh, one of the special, of the special forces guys grabbed my hand very slowly. He lowered my arm. He tilted his head, kind of looked at me like he didn't say anything. Was like hey, you're not supposed to do that. And so I tilted my head back into the side and I said, Am I not supposed to shoot them? He just shook his head no. And he looked at the doctor with much concern on his face, and they raised their hands up with their palms down, and they said, take him back to the barracks. So he took the gun out of my hand, he grabbed me by the arm, started walking me out the door, and as I was walking away, I heard the doctor say, he is very promising. And they did, and they kept getting more and more elaborate uh, to see what they could make you do without your knowledge and make you do something that would go completely against your grain. And the, the worst one, as far as the Manchurian candidate test goes, and there are some street gangs today that require this for someone to get in their gang, but uh, you had to kill who, or you had to have believed that you killed whoever it was who was your closest uh, family member or the closest person to you on this planet. In my case, they had me believe that I killed my dad in a very elaborate way. And the way it was, there was this uh, building that was completely uh, center blocks, concrete blocks, and the ceiling was maybe about uh, seven, maybe eight foot tall. And they had this uh, cinder block with this uh, blast glass, I guess you might call it, a uh, very thick glass, probably, I don't know, three inches thick or something, crystal clear, and you could see through it. And sitting about 10 feet in front of the uh, the blast glass was this individual uh, tied to a chair, and the latex mask that was all painted up that had reality to it uh, looked just like my father. And anyway, what I had to do was I had to go up to the, uh, the mannequin, open his mouth, and I stuck a live hand grenade in his mouth, uh, hold the pin, let the spoon flip, walked around back through the blast gas and look, and I watched my father, what I thought was my father's head and body being completely blown apart. Now, this is the kind of stuff they try to make you do without your knowledge.
knowledge. Well, what I was saying a little bit ago is uh, when I was talking to Sergeant Gray about this when he was still alive, I said, I remember uh, Wadsworth was there. And he said, Wadsworth, you mean the Indian? Well, there's no way he could have guessed that. And uh, uh, Specialist Wadsworth, he was a actual, real, legitimate American Indian. He grew up in the uh, Grand Canyon, as a matter of fact. And I was there when they brought him into uh, the project. And he went to do the very first test that I did. And they told him that he had to shoot the image. And I heard Wadsworth say, he goes, I'm not going to kill for you. And they got aggressive. You have to do it. He goes, I'm not going to kill for you. And he repeated it several times. And finally said, uh, well, go ahead and uh, uh, clean him out. He's not going to be any good to us. So just take him back to his unit. He's done. And that's the best thing that could ever happen. You know, yeah. that is the, that uh, his inner body took over. Even though his mind was full of that mind-altering junk, uh, his inner self took over. And he would not kill for them. That's like thumbs up, dude. Yeah, simulations, wow, like crazy there, too. Let's go back to the phones west of the Rockies. Howard, out of Vancouver, Washington, you are on the air, Howard. Hello, Connie and Eric. Uh, I, had, I haven't got a question, but uh, I think you've answered one of my old questions. Uh, let, let me explain here. Uh, back in 1969-70, uh, I was uh, stationed at Fort Bragg. Uh, I was in a tank battalion that was... Uh, we were located out in the uh, Smoke Bomb Mill area, if you, you know where that's at. Oh, yeah. Okay, and uh, there was uh, about a half a dozen of us. You know, the, you know, you always uh, have a group of friends in a, in a unit like that, and uh, we used to go in, into uh, Fayetteville and have a good time every weekend. And uh, there was one fellow there that was uh, from New York. I remember we called him Jake. I, I, don't, I don't even know if that was his real name. We all had nicknames for each other. But uh, at any rate, uh, he was determined he was going to sign up for the Special Forces. And uh, we, we tried to talk him out of it, told him it, you know, it probably wasn't a very good idea, but uh, he was determined. And, and, uh, and sure enough, uh, one day he got his orders, and uh, the uh, JFK Special Forces Center was just down the road from us there. And uh, they sent him over there, and we didn't see him for about a month. He was, uh, you know, we knew him. He was uh, kind of a happy-go-lucky character. You know, he, he was a, you know, a good-natured guy. And uh, about a month later, he came back, and he was uh, completely had a complete personality change. Uh, he was, he is, he was mean. Uh, you know, you know, we, none of us could deal with him. Uh, nobody wanted anything to do with him. He was getting in fights constantly. Uh, he, you know, he couldn't go into town without getting in trouble. And uh, all these years, I've, I've wondered uh, just exactly what they did to him. And, and uh, you answered that question for me. I'm glad I could help. Yeah, Howard, thanks for calling in. Great story. Wow. Yeah, I, I that's what it sounds like. Uh, did, wait a minute. Well, did they try by erasing your memory of it? Maybe they would think that that wouldn't happen, right? That maybe uh, they wouldn't change you noticeably. But, that, that, I mean... Obviously, there were consequences along the way, or did they try to do that? Or, Oh, yeah, they always uh, want to uh, erase your memory. For, for one, it's for your own good. And two, because uh, they don't want you being able to, uh, you know, live through this, uh, you know, wake up, realize what's going on, and start going to, you know, any kind of uh, maybe authorities and start naming names because they hide behind classified. And that's the thing that irritates me so much is they do such unethical and I dare say criminal things, uh, not just to uh, everyday people. They do it to their troops. Uh, in the days of MK MKUltra, uh, orphans, uh, homeless people. As a matter of fact, as far as uh, homeless people go, when some of us, uh, myself included, were, were getting out of line to where their stuff wasn't having the effect on us that they wanted it to, and we were getting out of line. And so they would do these uh, setups to where sometimes they would use, uh, you know, real-life-looking mannequins and put all the goodies inside the body, you know, and other times they'd use real people. And uh, one particular time, uh, a bunch of us had got out of line, and we were back-talking, and, you know, doctors didn't like that. So they took us 
to a factory. I'm thinking it was a, a meat factory of some kind, and they had this uh, grinder there. And there was this feller, and I believe he was uh, real. I don't think it was a mannequin. I think he was a real guy. And they had snatched up this uh, homeless guy, and they gave us the little speech about we don't need to be back talking and all this and do what we're told. It was like, why? And so they picked up this guy, and they shoved him in the grinder. And, oh, nice. uh, and they said, you see what happened to him? Now, you get back in line and quit back talking, or that's going to be you. Uh, they did another one where they had us, uh, it was at night, and they had had these uh, metal uh, or wooden spikes, maybe a combination of both, and they're about a good uh, seven foot tall, and they had a couple of the ops guys, uh, they were on top of like a small building that was maybe, you know, 10, 12 foot in the air, and they had us uh, staring at these spikes and looking up at this guy. Well, they had one of these real life looking mannequins, and they threw it out and impaled it on that on those spikes of course in our state of mind we thought that it was a real person now they said see what happened to him he back talked you quit back talking or that's going to be you and so those are just a couple of uh, many examples that they did to get us uh, back in line when we were back talking and uh, some of these uh, uh, troops like myself once we were considered by the doctors perfected, when they were trying to develop techniques and t new technology to uh, use, and one of them, it's like uh, you said, Miss Connie, that uh, some of the stuff that you investigate and all these other uh, guests and people have checked out, some of it gets so way out and so elaborate, most people would choose not to believe it. But then when I started meeting people, that verified this, people who were in military intelligence, and they verified this to me. And I know we're getting short on time, but the one I want to uh, come to an end with here, and then we'll take another call, is... Uh, <laughs> he is now the, the host of the show, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> but, uh, You're smooth. I like, I like it. You're smooth. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to make it too scary. But, uh, you know, no, I think I think see that I think that's important too, so people will know that because if that was even happening back then, how scary it was back then, and I think the scarier the better, so people will have a knowledge. But what are they doing now? Exactly how how uh, far advanced is their uh, technology now, and what kind of stuff are they doing now? I mean with. Uh, virtual virtual reality, holographic right. images, yes. and all that. But anyway... Um, so you got anyway, three minutes, FYI, three minutes okay. to tell us. Okay. We got loaned out to the Navy. They were developing this thing that later on I found out was a rebreather. It was a Project Aquaman, and after the cartoon character, and it would allow them to breathe underwater without the use of oxygen tanks. And uh, once they perfected that, they tried to implement, uh, they were implementing Project Whale, which stood for Well Hidden Amphibious Long Range Expedition. And had, long, had Project Whale succeeded, they were going to initiate Operation Jonah. Now, this free breather was going to be used for a specific group, and this group was known as the Sea Dragons. The Sea Dragons were to the Navy SEALs what Delta Force was to the Green Berets. They were the next step up. And anyway, just as they had used all the mind-altering stuff on us, they were also using it on animals, specialized animals. Well, this particular uh, project, they had a whale, which was the kind that was used in the movie uh, Moby Dick and uh, uh, Pinocchio. The big sperm whale had the huge head and the mouth with lots of room in there. And what it was is they would put us in this whale's mouth, and they were doing these various testings. And anyway, uh, to, for whatever they were testing on, and anyway, I was the last one to go through this one particular test, and everything had gone like clockwork. And then about two or three minutes before the test was supposed to end, to everybody's horror, the whale came too. And I got to do my impression of Jonah and the whale. I got swallowed. And anyway, the whale broke loose and took off back in the ocean, and they had to go out and get this uh, whale. Well, somehow they killed the whale. I didn't know how they did it, but they did. Yeah. And anyway, uh, whichever Navy
navy ships they were using, the small ones, they pushed the whale back up on the beach. And uh, the commander of the time, Marcinko was his name, uh, he was the overseer of this project, and they brought out something. I don't, I'm not sure it was a chainsaw or what it was, but they cut this whale open. And the commander himself walked in there and found what appeared to be my lifeless body. And this kind of gets hard to tell, but I'll tell it for the show. And he, this guy was a battle-hardened Navy SEAL. I mean, he was the toughest of the tough. And he brought me out. I was across his arms. They already had the medics on the beach. And he laid me down, and they went to work on me right away, hooked me up with oxygen and all this stuff. And also, I was still uh, full of that mind-altering stuff, the control part. And uh, they said, sir, we're losing him. And the commander stood over me. He goes, don't you die on me, soldier. Damn it, nobody dies on me. Don't you die on me. And I started coming, too, because I had oxygen and stuff. I sat up, and I said, like, hey, whatever you say, chief. And he's, whoa. Well, the end result was three colonels lost their eagles over it, and they terminated the project. Oh, my. Oh, my. Good stories, a lot of information, not enough time. But you can catch Eric, the mind control guy, who you've heard call in many, many times along the way and throughout the years and the decades on the road in his truck <laughs> somewhere along the way you've heard him call in and now for the first time he came on and told some more stories and of course you could you you have so many more and that's why i had suggested to him hey do like a facebook group or something so he did start one you can go to uh facebook and you can go to eric the mind control guy there and join in and uh it looks like eric you're going to stay busy in there with that facebook group they're, they're already writing in saying and things and uh, uh, I want to say thanks for coming in and joining us and giving us some some time today. Thank you for that. Uh, call me back anytime, Connie. I'll be more happy. All right. Any last words? Uh, I Ten would seconds. like this. If anybody <laughs> in Washington is listening, you know, uh, knock off all this classified stuff. Uh, let's see what happened to our troops. And you know, people throughout the years who were done horribly wrong, like the uh, American citizens of Japanese descent who were put in those internment ta camps. It took them 40-some years for these people to get anything, uh, and they got $20,000, which they were entitled to, and they were entitled to more than that. But all these young people like myself, 17, 18, 19-year-old young people go into service, and then they get subject to what I get subjected to, and we go to the VA, and basically we get told, we don't know you. Something's got to give. The Congress has the Congress All right. and the Senate. They can do something about it. But. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Eric, the mind control guy. Appreciate it. Very nice, articulate, and uh, incredible information. Classic coast. Well, more to come. We've got Annetta Hunter.